I feel quite um, privileged to be here today in support of, of Karen and Gillian Murray and the petition and their campaigning and um, they're just both so courageous and I'm, I'm just so full of admiration in many respects. Um, um, Karen's not just a constituent now, she's she's a friend um, and I wish, I didn't know her so well but um, I'm not as, as brave as Karen but Karen emailed me um, not for the first time, we'd been in touch about another issue, but um, during Christmas recess um, in 2017, um, my office was technically closed, my staff were on holiday and I was the person monitoring the, the inbox and you joke that, oh well, you know, it'll be a quiet time and unless there's a, a flood or something locally, th there won't be much happening. Um, I checked my inbox very early on the the morning of the 30th of December, it was a Saturday morning, and Karen McKeown had emailed me at 7.42 a.m. Um, to inform me that, that Luke had died at home by suicide. Um, so that was really the start of, of, of my journey working um, with Karen and, and her family, and I'm, I'm grateful to Karen's sister who's in, in the gallery today, because I think without having immediate family support, I don't know how people can continue, and, and I think it is, such an injustice that, that Gillian Murray can't be here today because she now is struggling with her own mental health and is experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. We, in my office, we've spent a lot of time with Karen. We've been in touch with NHS Lanarkshire. We've progressed the formal complaint and, and you know, the ombudsman and, and so on. And I'm aware that in Parliament and in government, there's, there's lots going on nationally in terms of different reviews and, and, and different strategies. But what Karen's talking about today um, isn't so much about legislative change. Partly it is about, about culture change. It is about the attitudes. And um, I know Karen won't mind me saying this, but having studied all the information about Luke's case and about Karen's experience, I think partly... The reason why Karen was dismissed by professionals is perhaps because she's a, a young working class woman, someone who's seen as just a mother, just a partner, who doesn't have um, the, the, the right insight, the right knowledge. And I think as Karen has shown very powerfully today, is that she's right. You know, if you um, love someone, if you live with a family member, you know that person inside out. She was able to see the changes in Luke's behaviour and knew his medical history. And I think the fact that we don't have integrated data, integrated health um, and, and care information shows that, that when there are those gaps, people fall through those gaps. So Karen's already touched on some of the points I wanted to make, and I'm grateful to members here for your very considered questions. I know as a Central Scotland MSP that, that even within Lanarkshire, there are inconsistencies. But as we know from Gillian Murray's testimony in Tayside, and I'm sure other members will know from their own areas, that there is inconsistency right across um, the, the, the country. Um, so I just want to, 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 to ask Karen, um, you know, given that you've been able to work closely with Gillian Murray and organisations like Chrissy's House that brought you into contact with other, other families, um, at a national level, we say people should ask once and they'll get help. Are there areas in the country that are doing this really well and are learning the lessons and we can look to that good practice? Or do we really need that national approach where we have to make sure that in terms of guidelines, in terms of um, the out of hours services that you've mentioned, that we really need to look at a wholesale approach? I would say... <coughs> From speaking to the people that's contacted me through my campaign, I've no kind of heard any positive um, feedback from the mental health service. But what I can say from my own experience with, with my son as CAMS, but from going from a, ser a service that, that said that it wasn't, um, that it didn't fit the criteria, and then going to a new service who is, I honestly cannot fault the CAMS worker he's got at the minute she's she's goes above above and beyond she's really helping look she's really there for for me and stuff like that so i can't actually fault so that is the only kind of good experience i've had i would say 
everybody that's told me, I don't think there's any services that are actually getting it right, apart from the charities. Um, and there is some amazing charities out there, like Chris's House, Farms, and then in our local area, there is a new one um, that's just kind of opened up um, in the one of the local high schools. So there is some amazing charities. I would say that the charities are the best way to go forward because they're the ones that are actually out there pushing and campaigning and actually understanding the people because I don't feel as if the NHS are getting it. Can I pick up on the the question around the, the ministerial meeting that we had, I, I was with Karen at that, that meeting and we did have high hopes because it's, it's great that Scotland does have a mental health minister, it's a dedicated role and the current minister is a mental health nurse herself with, with lots of experience in, in the health service. Um, I think it's fair to say, Karen, that you didn't ask for that meeting to have a cup of tea and, and to have more sympathy because there's, there's plenty of sympathy around um, what you were looking for. Um, was, was action. In, in the meeting, we discussed the fact that there is um, there are additional barriers when it's perceived that someone has a substance um, misuse addiction um, or that they actually do. And there's, there's different doors that people are, are sent to. And sometimes it's a case of um, you have to have your addiction resolved before you can access mental health treatment. Can I, can I just ask um, you to say, a bit more about that because when we've discussed it, um, you know, you've expressed that there is that disconnect. When we asked the minister about it, um, she advised that she was working on the mental health and suicide prevention side of it, and the public health minister was working on the addiction side of it. Um, how do you feel about that? I'd say the addiction side of it, the addiction side is, it caused a lot of problems by Luke's case in particular, and I know it causes a lot of problems for other people because, as you said, the addiction has to be addressed before they'll deal with your mental health. Now, my opinion is, is addiction is mental health. If you take, yeah, you use a substance, whatever it may be, to black out from what's actually going on in your head, so it's just adding fuel to the fire. In Luke's particular case, Luke had actually stopped using substances three to four weeks before he died, so he had addressed Fair enough, it wasn't fully addressed, but he had addressed addictions issues, um, and he had he had no longer taken any substances when he in the time he died because in his toxicology report it came back with nothing in his system. So I would say the addiction addiction side of things is causing a lot of hassle where people are saying you have to go to addictions, you have to go to addictions, you have to go to addictions. Well, where's the crisis centre for addictions? Where's the crisis centre there? Where is the where is the pathway program for people that's coming off with people that's coming off cocaine? Where is the recognition that there is psychological effects, that there is withdrawal processes there, and it can lead to psycho that can lead to drug induced psychosis, which is a mental health condition. So although the addiction needs to be addressed, it does lead it is mental health and it does lead to mental health. And I think that needs to be addressed wider as well. So you'd probably see me back in a couple of months. <laughs> and you've talked about some of the attitudes that you've encountered and no doubt you know um you know many the majority of people working in our health services are, are, are very compassionate and um you know share the values of, of the nhs but there is a lot of stigma still around mental health but particularly around addiction um that 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 stigma do you feel that's still a barrier for people who are trying to access services certainly is um i think with the stigma that comes it to say you're addicted to something people automatically assume that it's heroin or alcohol and I think that there's a wider range of addictions issues out there there's the legal highs that are in the up and the crisis that's going to come with that in the coming years is going to be phenomenal you've got the cocaine epidemic that you throw a stone and you'll probably find somebody that has either took it or has to, or still takes it and I think that these these side effects need they, these the effects of the, the addiction and the stigma surrounding it needs to end because it could happen to anybody. Mental health shows no discrimination. Addiction shows no discrimination. And everybody in any walk of life could be affected. And I think that's where the stigma needs to kind of get broke. It's coming from the kind of tap is be clear hockey. It was, that's not my issue. That's somebody else's. No, it's mental health. It's everybody's issue. It's, it's our country. And if we want to make our country better, we need to start putting things into like mental health and addictions and 
education and all the other things that really need more attention rather than the pettiness that it's getting spent on. Can I just bring up another point briefly, convener? Um, Karen, as I said, emailed me in December, um, the 30th of December 2017, um, just before uh, New Year's Eve last year, so 2018, I had a, a, an email from another constituent in Lanarkshire from a, a father of a, a young man who's in his 20s. And um, I'm still haunted by Karen's email. I mean, I got this other email, there were echoes that felt very similar. And the reason why I wanted to mention that is because Today, the committee's touched on the fact that there are times in the year when people are more at risk. Um, Christmas can be a difficult time, and when services are winding down um, for the Christmas holidays, um, it can be more difficult to get to get support. Um, on New Year's Eve, I basically had to doorstep NHS Lanarkshire and go down to their headquarters in Bothwell because um, this young constituent who had been discharged from hospital, um, it was again, Wishaw General actually discharged in early December after a suicide attempt and he completed psychiatric assessment, which I think takes five, ten minutes. He ticks some boxes and, and he was discharged. Um, but um, I think it was the 29th of December, his, his father got in touch and they were very concerned and, and they thought he was at high risk of, of suicide. Um, when I went to NHS Lanarkshire, because they were having trouble getting um, access to the community substance misuse team. Um, I was told that they were reluctant to give me the phone number for the community substance misuse team. It's a mobile phone number. And they were very concerned because um, the service is really overstretched and um, they were worried that they might get in a date of the call. So I promised that I would not advertise the phone number. That, 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 was, that was New Year's Eve. Um, and I was genuinely afraid. Um, I was worried that, that this young man, who I can't name because um, his family um, are going through hell, there's, there's drug addiction, there's alcohol addiction, and he's now going through the, the justice process. Um, but I was worried that he was going to be another Luke Henderson. So it does strike me that at that time of year, at Christmas and New Year, that's a particularly difficult time. Um, I just wonder, Karen, from your contact your, your network now of, of people sadly affected by suicide across the country is that a common experience at, at that time of year that it can be very difficult to get help it's definitely very common um, because of the scale and staff that run over christmas and new year it's not they're not ruling at full capacity for nearly two weeks sometimes a bit longer depending on where the holidays fall and stuff so it's definitely something that echoes throughout the full thing even I know how, but I'm like at Christmas now, and like Christmas past there, it was horrendous. But I'm lucky enough that I have got family, and I have my mental health does deteriorate at times. But I'm lucky enough that I can, I'm are able to pull it out. And I have got good supports, but not everybody's got that. And it's definitely Christmas period. There needs to be more support specifically around Christmas and the holiday periods. Thank you. And just one last tiny wee point, convener. Um, thank you for your, your patience. Thinking about, Karen, your own um, health now and, and, and Gillian Murray and people who have gone through this, there is work going on nationally and the Scottish Government are, are doing good work on this to make sure that all services are trauma-informed across the, the health service. Um, it can be quite difficult to go back into the GP practice to go back to, to a &E, to go back um, um, into hospitals when, when perhaps that's, you know, bringing up quite difficult memories and also you feel like you're having to answer all the same questions and sometimes there's a bit of judgment there. Um, is there any last point you'd want to make about how widespread training needs to be beyond just the mental health specialists? Is it everyone across the NHS that needs to be up in their game on this. I would definitely say that all 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 aspects of healthcare, specifically GPs, um, I think some of the GPs attitude, like what I some I went and tried to get myself a GP surgery um, and found myself in a middle of a full blown debate with a GP who told me that I had to go grow up. Now I feel that at that point in time I was not mentally 
too well at that point, and I needed somebody to say to me, right, look, this is what you need, and try and, I suppose, calm me down a bit, which a GP should do. So I definitely feel that GPs and more healthcare workers have to be more advised on suicide and mental health and the awareness and stuff like that. But GPs in particular need to be more aware of how to handle patients and how to, how to recognise that somebody isn't mentally distressed. Um, but I definitely feel that it has to be widespread.